Hey there everybody, welcome to another video. In this video we're going to talk about some rational functions as they relate to transformations. The main thing I want you to get out of this video is the interplay between two new functions and their vertical asymptotes, uh, or each vertical asymptote that these, these functions have. The oddness and the evenness of multiplicity, what that looks like. This is a great video that gives us kind of a, um, a stepping stone onto graphing rational functions because these two graphs are going to help us really deal with how a function uh, kind of interplays with a vertical asymptote when we get to rational functions and we deal with those vertical asymptotes as a whole. So we're going to study two new functions. We're going to look at their asymptotes. There's a horizontal and a vertical. We'll deal with some key points. We're going to do some transformations. But as we go through this, remember what I want you to get out of it. I want you to see how the, the function interplays with the vertical asymptote. That's what I'm trying to get you to see here. So let's take a look at the first, uh, first two functions. We have two functions, f of x equals 1 over x, and then f of x equals 1 over x squared. This first function is called the reciprocal function sometimes. They're both rational functions, but this has a special name called the reciprocal function. So if you ever asked for that, that's what they're referring to. And we're going to go ahead and graph them. The first thing I want to do is what we practiced last time, dealing with a vertical asymptote. You know this, that the first thing we do in graphing is look at the domain. So let's take a look at the domain of 1 over x. And right off the, the bat, we see that if x equals 0, we have a pretty serious problem. You remember this, that we factored this. It's already factored. It said every factor on the denominator, that's just x, equal to 0. And that defines our domain. So we'd say, OK, we cannot allow x to equal 0. So at x equals 0, we have something that's not allowed, either a whole or a vertical asymptote. That's the way in which we can't allow x to equal 0. It's a weird way to say it, but it's kind of what we're doing. So we'd set x equals 0 and say, that's a problem. That creates this domain issue for us, and that defines a graph issue. So we look at x. We say, hey, if x equals 0, that, factors, uh, that factor is causing a problem for us. So let's see if we can cancel the factor out. If we can, then that's a whole. If we can't, then that is a vertical asymptote. And we say, well, we can't cancel out x. There's no way to do that. So at x equals 0, we have what is called a vertical asymptote. going to abbreviate VA for vertical asymptote. And then we notice that the power of x is 1. That gives us an odd multiplicity vertical asymptote. And as we studied in the last video, we know that odd vertical asymptotes behave like this or like this, depending on some signs. So this is odd. Here's what I want you to associate with odd vertical asymptotes. That they, Odd means opposite, so odd or opposite infinity. So if you can remember that, odd multiplicity for vertical asymptotes means opposite infinities. That's kind of the same idea for odd x-intercepts. That was opposite signs. That's why they had to cross. Here we have opposite infinities. You don't cross anything with them because they're, it's not continuous, uh, but they go to opposite infinities. And we talked about why that was in that video. So here's what we know about this. We know right now that at x equals 0, we have a vertical asymptote. We're going to show that with a vertical dotted line. And so what that sort of is, is it's like a force field. This graph cannot touch that, and, but it's going to interact with it. It's going to come up to it and either go up or down, depending on some signs. We're going to figure this out in a minute. But it cannot cross it. That's why this, this function is not continuous across the entire um, x-axis. It is on its domain because the domain excludes x equals 0, but not a, uh, on the entire x-axis. Let's go ahead and do the two other things we need for transformations. Number one, I'm just going to tell you right now that this thing has a horizontal asymptote. We're going to study this in the very next video, like when you would get a horizontal asymptote. I'm going to show you right now that end behavior can give you a horizontal asymptote. This horizontal uh, line that your function actually can cross, but ultimately at the end behavior is going to uh, tend to, to that value. And so this horizontal asymptote is at y equals 0. Horizontal, remember, y equals a value. Vertical is x equals. Horizontal is y equals. And this is going to be 0. How I know that is because if you let x increase without bound or decrease without bound, so in other words, it's, it's this idea of a limit. 
Um, a limit is take x and let it approach, never really get there, but approach some value. Get really, 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 really close to, or get closer and closer and closer to some value. If we let x increase to like positive infinity and 1 stays the same, well, then 1 divided by a number that's really, 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 really big is very, 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 very close to 0. Does it ever equal 0? No, it doesn't. And that's the idea of a limit, in as simple as I can make it for you. Let's let x go to negative infinity. Well, 1 divided by something that's really, 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 really big in absolute value, but negative, is still going to be close to 0, but sort of a negative approaching of 0. So this graph has that horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. We're going to show that with another dotted line. And so we know this has two asymptotes. It has a vertical, it's got a horizontal, at x equals 0 and y equals 0 respectively. Now we're going to talk about some key points. So the key points here are, well, really just found by trying to plug in some values. Now we know we can't evaluate 0. Why not? Well, that's a domain restriction. But we can evaluate at x equals 1 and x equals negative 1. And you remember that key points are really important for our transformations. We're going to use them here too. And they're really just trying to plug in 1, 0, and negative 1. If we can't plug in 0, we just plug in 1 and negative 1. So let's evaluate. Let's put in 1. 1 divided by 1 is 1. So we're going to have this key point of 1, 1. And likewise, if we evaluate for negative 1, 1 divided by negative 1 is negative 1. So we have negative 1, negative 1. And you might have kind of guessed by the exponent that multiplicity was 1. And so we might assume that this is an odd function. Well, our key points bear that out. And the way that our signs interact also bear that out. So even an oddness is usually uh, just power functions of polynomials. But when we take a look at this, this, at least that's where we get the name from, this is an odd function. And so we do have the symmetry about the origin. So if you take this picture and rotate it 180 degrees, you're getting the same picture. What that means is that when we graph this, we have to interact appropriately with our asymptotes and still make it through our key points. So here's how this function absolutely has to, to look. And if you think about it, if you plug in positive values, you're going to get positive values. You're going to be in this first quadrant. If you plug in negative values of x, you're going to be getting out negative values. You're going to be in the third quadrant. So how this function looks It's about like that. It gives you a very, very good look at what nearly every, well, not near, I can't say nearly every uh, asymptote looks like, but all odd asymptotes are going to have this sort of relationship. Either this, or if that was negative, it would reflect. Notice how the signs would reflect. If you had a negative here, negative 1 over x, then positives would give you negatives, and negatives would give you positives. It would reflect this image. So this right here is how every single odd vertical asymptote, multiplicity 1 or 3 or 5 or odd, is going to look. Odd means opposite infinities. It's a very good practicing tool for us when we get to graphing rationals. So understand that an odd vertical asymptote is going to look like that. Odd means opposite infinity. So keep that in the back of your head. Now let's move on to the next one. We're going to do the same thing, but, but pretty quick. So we we're going to do... Um, Kind of likewise what we did over here, we're going to take our domain and say, all right, let's look at our, our function. And it's completely factored. And we go, all right, uh, how we deal with domain is we take every factor on the denominator and we set it equal to zero. Well, there's only one factor. There's x. It happens to be repeated, but there's only one factor. So we say, hey, if we take that factor and set it equal to zero, we are going to have a domain issue. x can't equal zero. Now we look back at that, that x. Can you cancel out the factor that's giving you the domain problem? If you can, you have a hole. If you can't, you have a vertical asymptote. Well, we can't. So we define our domain, and using the domain and the fact that we cannot cancel any factors helps us defi to define what happens at that value of x for which this function is not defined. So at x equals 0, we have a problem. This says you can't allow x equals 
you can't allow x equals zero, and now we're saying how you can't allow it. Are you not allowing it by it being a hole, just a missing point, or are you not allowing it by a vertical asymptote? And for the same reason we had over here, we are going to have a vertical asymptote. However, the multiplicity matters. Multiplicity of a vertical asymptote will tell you how it behaves. So when we look at that and go, hey, that's a, that's a multiplicity two for the factor that gave us a domain problem, for the factor that caused a vertical asymptote, that multiplicity two is even. Well, an even vertical asymptote does something different than an uh, odd vertical asymptote. Odd has opposite infinities, even has this idea of symmetry across this vertical line. It has this idea of same infinities, either both up or both down. So when we take a look at that, we go, all right, well, we know we have a vertical asymptote. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to draw that vertical line at x equals zero. So that's x equals zero, just like this one was. This also has a horizontal asymptote for the limit ideas, but I want you to look at it. If I start plugging in really, 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 really big positive numbers, by the way, I'm trying to preface our next, our next video on horizontal asymptotes here, just to get your, your brain kind of rolling on it. If I start plugging in really, really big values of x, I'm gonna get really, really, really little uh, numbers in a fraction. So one divided by like a billion is, is close to zero. A billion is not even close to infinity. So like one divided by a billion squared, oh my gosh, that's like super close to zero. One divided by a trillion squared, that's even closer to zero. So as I go this way for a long way, this function is gonna get super close to zero, even faster than this one did. Now let's plug in some negative numbers. If I plug in negative numbers, well, wait a minute, I'm squaring them. If you take a negative number and you square it, you end up still getting a positive. Well, that's true. So if I take really negative numbers, like negative a billion, and I square it, I'd still get one over a billion squared. It's going to be a perfectly symmetrical graph. Man, I need you to see that. I need you to see that this graph has symmetry across the y-axis. Why? Because that's a vertical asymptote. Because if I plug in positives and negatives, x squared takes the same value for those. If I plug in one or negative one, negative a billion or positive a billion, I'm gonna get the same exact values out. It's a mirror image. So this models perfectly how an even vertical asymptote works. It's gonna say, well, well, yeah, I mean, if it's symmetrical, you have to be going to the same infinity. If this is opposite, you have to go into different infinities. The signs would be different here. So we know that this is going to look like this if this is positive, or if I put a negative in front, I get all negative values. So no matter what, if I plug in any number here right now as the way it is, I'm getting all positives. If I put a negative in front of that and I square it and then make everything negative, I get all negative values. So we know what that's gonna look like. This also has a horizontal asymptote for the same reasons that one did. Um, and I just explained that. So as we go to positive and negative infinity, a limit idea says, what's the value of the function approaching? What's it getting to as your x gets to this value? So as our x gets to negative infinity, this function is getting close to zero. As x gets to positive infinity, this function is getting close to zero. It's doing the same thing on both sides. It has that symmetry. Now we're going to do our key points. So key points work the same way as this did. If I plug in 1, hey, 1 divided by 1 squared is still 1. We can't evaluate zero. We have already talked about why. It's not even defined there, but we can evaluate negative one. If I evaluate negative one, negative one squared is one. One divided by one is positive one. And we get the same look for even functions that we got for odd functions here. We have that, it may not help you remember this. For every odd function, we had the key points of one, one, zero, zero, and negative one, negative one. Now we're missing the zero, zero because of a domain restriction but we have the same key points as one, one, and negative one, negative one. For even, we always got one, one, zero, zero, and negative one, positive one. Well, we're missing the zero, zero again for domain restriction, but we have the same key points, at least these two key points, as every other even function, giving us that symmetry across that vertical line, which I want you to see as an asymptote. Now we're gonna go ahead and evaluate. So, or sorry, uh, graph it. So when we graph it, we have to behave with both our vertical and horizontal asymptote, it's gonna be a little bit more dynamic of a graph than this. It's gonna get smaller quicker. About like that, I kind of messed up that side. But you should get the feel for it. So before we move on to, to transformations, 
I just want to make sure that you see what I'm trying to get you to see. Number one, that these functions model what an odd vertical asymptote and an even vertical asymptote will look like all of the time. Yes, you can reflect this. Yes, you can reflect this. So even vertical asymptote will always look like this or like this, depending on sign issues. Odds will always look like this or like this, depending on sign issues. They all look like that, and I need you to know that. So we're going to practice that right now. I'm going to show you the transformations. We're going to be transforming with our shifting. Remember, up, down, left, right, reflecting, uh, using our key points. We're going to be doing that. Uh, that's why we do our key points here. But I always am going to be referring to, hey, take a look at your vertical asymptote and see how this is relating. So that's what we're going to do. All right, let's get started. So we have f of x equals 1 over x squared plus 3. How we deal with transformations, even on rational functions, is to base it on some sort of a basic graph shape. And these two are now in our library of functions. We have the reciprocal function and 1 over x squared. We know odd vertical asymptote and we know even. That's basically what that's doing for us. So this is based on this sort of x squared, 1 over x squared idea. We should kind of know that we're either doing this or doing this depending on what sign we're given. Since that's positive, we're probably going to do this. We have this even vertical asymptote, but we have this plus three. What we learned a long time ago, and if you want to refresh your memory, go back and watch transformations video, that plus three is a vertical shift. Anything after the function, outside of parentheses, after like the function's been dealt with, uh, plus or minus, plus means up and minus means down. So that's a vertical shift up three units. This uh, would, does not have a vertical, uh, sorry, a horizontal shift left or right. That would happen in parentheses like that one. So all this plus three is doing is saying, hey, take this function, shift it up three spots, and that's about it. So if it doesn't shift left or right, but it does shift up, what that does to our function, it takes our asymptotes and it moves those as well. Well, wait a minute. That means that's a really nice way to graph. And this is why I taught you the transformations that I did a long time ago is because it's modeled right here perfectly. So what that plus three does is says, well, wait a minute. If I had a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero like I did here, but I'm shifting up three units, let's just imagine that my horizontal asymptote is gonna be shifted up three. And you know what? It is gonna be shifted up three. Well, hang on, is it, what about our vertical asymptote? Are we shifting that left or right? And the answer is no, that x squared, there's, there's nothing being added or subtracted inside parentheses before we square it. So I'm not shifting my vertical asymptote at all. So we looked at it, we said, okay, this is gonna be this type of a graph. I'm shifting it up three. I've moved my horizontal asymptote up three. I didn't have to move my vertical asymptote at all. And now I just need to put in my key points and I can graph this. So my key points are usually one, one and negative one, one. Why? Well, because it's even. We already figured that out. This is an even function, and it has the same key points as every even function. That's an odd function. All of these are going to have the key points like that odd function, unless you start manipulating them, like reflecting them or multiplying by some sort of a constant coefficient. So let's go ahead and plot that. Here's 1, 1, and negative 1, positive 1, but we're going to plot it in relation to where we shifted this horizontal and vertical asymptote. We don't want to go down here and put 1, 1. That's not going to work because we shifted everything up. You're going to put this at 1, 1 and negative 1, 1 in relation to like your new x, y axis. I know this doesn't exist here. Like this is not your actual x axis. This is your horizontal asymptote. We did shift that. So that's what that is. Use your key points in relation to that. Just wherever your horizontal asymptote is, that's where your key points fit. So 1, 1 and negative 1, 1 in relation to that, thing, that, uh, that horizontal asymptote. The real points are 1, 4 and negative 1, 4. That's true. Also, I want to make this, this mention, if you want to be a little bit more accurate with this, do things like find the y-intercept. Now, we can't here because x is equal to 0 it gives us this domain problem. So we can't do that. Uh, but what we could do is plug in something like 1 half, uh, negative 1 half, or plug in 1 half and use symmetry. If I plug in 1 half, 1 half squared is 1 fourth. But 1 divided by 1 fourth is 4. 4 plus 3 is 7. So if I plug in 1 half, I get 7. Now remember, 
that this is an even function, it has to be symmetrical across that vertical asymptote. I'm going to start saying that uh, very specifically, that it's symmetrical across your vertical asymptote, because as we shift, you're going to lose that thought of symmetrical across the y, because we're shifting that asymptote, but it will be symmetrical across the vertical asymptote. So if I plug in negative one half, I would have to get the same value. That gives us a little bit better of a graph. We know that we have to behave with our asymptotes. And we get an x, one over x squared graph just shifted up three units, and that's a very solid graph for very minimal work. That's what I would expect for you to do, is to be able to look at this and think, oh, that's one over x squared, that's gonna look like this or like this. Oh, that's a vertical shift up three, great. That's not reflected because it's positive. I'm not changing my, my um, key points at all. I'm gonna shift, use my key points, and then I'm gonna graph. Now, let's take a look at the vertical asymptote to make sure that it models what we thought it would model. So I'm, if I take a look at this domain-wise, and I look at, hey, let's look at our denominator. Our denominator is uh, just as a factor of x. If I set that equal to zero, that defines a domain problem for me. So I look at my, my factor. Can I cross out the x or the x squared? No, I can't. So at x equals zero, I have a vertical asymptote and the multiplicity is even. That gives us the symmetry. That's exactly what we said here, and that's why this picture looks that way. Here's our vertical asymptote at x equals zero. Here's the evenness of it. It's going to the same infinity, and that's what I want you to know. Let's move on to the next example. Okay, so we got g of x equals 1 over x minus 1 squared minus 2. The first thing that we want to do if we're going to do this transformation-wise is we're going to identify our shifts. So that minus 2, notice how here's our function. It's based on this power 2. Oh, man, I need you to see that. This is like based on the 1 over x squared. It's just it has a shift and another shift. We always want to deal with the vertical shift first uh, because this gives us just an easier way to identify what the horizontal one is, frankly. So I'm going to look at that and go, okay, that minus 2, that is a vertical shift down two units. It's after the function. We identify that as a vertical shift down. What that does for us, let that move your asymptotes. So here's our negative 2. That's going to give us our horizontal asymptote at y equals negative 2 now. So we just shifted it down two spots. Now, what's the minus 1 do? Anything in parentheses, including here, even though it looks weird, anything in parentheses is a horizontal shift in your function. And so here we have that minus 1. The problem is, is that it's opposite. So minus 1 is a shift to the right not a shift to the left. I know we kind of want it to be, but we studied that in transformations. We identified why that was. So that minus 1 is a shift to the right one unit. Well, now what that does, it says, hey, if you had a vertical asymptote at y equals 0, but this entire function is shifted to the right, it's going to shift that vertical asymptote to the right as well. It's not going to change the fact that it's even. It's just going to move it. And so we've moved this horizontal asymptote down to, sure, the whole function shifted down to, and right one, sure, the whole function shifted to right one. And now from there, because your key points interact specifically with your asymptotes, we're going to plot our key points, but we're going to do it in relation to where this stuff ended up. So we're going to plot our key points of 1, 1, and negative 1, 1. It's an even function. It has to be that. It's even in relation only to that vertical asymptote, though. Notice how it's not an even function anymore. So like in relation to the y-axis, it's not going to be symmetrical about the y-axis, but it is going to have symmetry across your vertical asymptote. And by showing it, by doing it this way, you're actually showing the axis of symmetry automatically. So again, down two, move your horizontal asymptote. Uh, left, right, one, move your vertical asymptote. You've shown the axis of symmetry. You will have symmetry about that vertical line, but no longer the y-axis. And now we're going to plot it. So we're going to use the same scale, but plot our key points from our, our new horizontal and vertical asymptote. That's from here, that's 1, 1, and negative 1, 1. If we wanted to be a little bit more specific on where things happen, we might want to plug in some other values. Uh, like you could plug in 1 half or... 
uh, one and a half if you wanted to, use some symmetry there. You could plug in the value like three. Uh, you could plug in the value like negative one and get a, a more specific curve out of it. Now, since we know the shape of this, we can, we can sketch it pretty accurately. We know that because this is even, we have these key points, you've already shown your key points, this graph has to look like this. It has to interact with our asymptotes in a certain way. Every even asymptote, vertical asymptote, will look like that, or reflected and going downward. Now, let's take a look at our, our uh, vertical asymptote specifically from a domain standpoint, make sure that it matches and we're really good to go. So how we would deal with domain is you would take the factor on the denominator, after everything's factored, set all the factors on the denominator equal to zero. You're using the zero product property in a way that says, if your denominator equals zero, you got a problem. Well, every factor can make that happen. So, x minus one equals zero says at x equals one, you have a problem. That is your domain. You can allow any value on the x-axis except for one. Well, now use that and what the factor, well, sorry, what the function says about the factor to define what happens at one. Do you have a hole or a vertical asymptote? So we look back and say, hey, x equals one is a problem. That's why it's excluded from our domain. Comes from a factor of x minus one. So can you cancel out x minus one? Uh, no. So that means it's a vertical asymptote. So we're using the factor to define what's happening at this exclusion. So you can't allow one. So at x equals one, you have some sort of a, a domain problem, a discontinuity. Either it's a hole or a vertical asymptote. Well, at x equals one, we know that that's gonna be a vertical asymptote due to the fact you can't cancel out the factor. But, we also know that the factor has a multiplicity too. That is giving us an even, an even vertical asymptote. Even vertical asymptotes have to have at least a symmetry of infinity along that vertical asymptote. It's gonna be both go to positive infinity or both go to negative. So we know for sure that this fits our model. So we have even, hey, you're going to positive infinity from uh, as x approaches one from the left and the right. So as we get there from the left, we're going, yeah, we're getting closer and closer. From the right, yep, yeah, we're getting closer and closer, but it's positive. And I want you to look at this, just think through, and this is how we sort of start talking about limits. Think through if you plugged in numbers that were real, real close to one, but positive. Stick with me here, don't lose focus. If I get really close to one from the positive values, so I'm talking about like 1.00001. 1.00001 minus one is 0 0.00001. If I square that, it's even smaller, it's point, like 0 0.00000001. One divided by that value is huge. Take it on your calculator if you want. One divided by 0 0.00000001 is really, really, really big. Now, subtract two from it. You still get something that's freaking huge. So as I get closer to one from the right-hand side, I'm getting epically large values. Do the same thing from the left-hand side. Plug in something like 0.999999999. 0.999999999 minus one is 0 0.00000001, but negative. Well, square it. Oh, wait. Squaring negative numbers gives us something that's positive. One divided by that really small positive number is going to do the same exact thing as the right-hand side did. It's going to give you epically large numbers, even if you subtract two. So that's why this looks the way it does, is when we're getting close to a, a value that's giving us zero on a denominator. Think about this really focus here. Use your critical thinking. If I'm getting close to a value on the x-axis that's giving me zero, then just to the left and right, is gonna be really close to zero, but I'm dividing by that number. Any constant divided by something that's approaching zero, not zero itself, you can't divide by zero, but something approaching zero, really close to it, is going to give me very, very, very large numbers. One divided by something super close to zero is still gonna be super big. Try to calculate a few times if you want. Take one divided by like, uh, 0 0.01, divide by 0 0.0001, divide by 0 .0, put as many zeros as you can, and then a little one. And, and you're gonna see those, those numbers get really large. That's why this looks that way. We explored it a little bit uh, when we talked about uh, vertical asymptote in the last video, but now that you're seeing it, you should it should be kind of gelling on why this is looking the way that it is, why they're going to the same infinity, because you're squaring 
both a negative and a positive number and getting the same output. We're going to come back with two more examples. We'll deal with one of these and one of these again, and then we'll be done. All right, let's go ahead and start the next example. So let's take a look at h of x equals negative 2 over x plus 3 squared uh, minus 4. The first thing I want you to notice is what the function is based on. So this is based on that 1 over x squared idea. It's just been shifted around a lot and then reflected, and the outputs have been multiplied by 2. That's what we should have learned when we got into transformations a whole bunch of videos ago. We're just applying it here and taking a look at how this relates to a vertical asymptote. So I'm going to start the same way. I'm going to start by saying that right there says we have a shift down 4. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's move our horizontal asymptote down 4. Next, we say, well, what's that do? Inside of parentheses in your function with your variable, when it's right next to the variable in parentheses, what you have is some sort of a horizontal shift. Plus means left and minus means right. So this is a shift left three units. Well, that also shifts our vertical asymptote. We're going to have symmetry here for sure, but it's around the vertical asymptote. And now we're going to identify our key points. So how this function, the 1 over x squared function works, it's based on an even function. So it's based on the fact that we have to have negative 1, 1 and positive 1, 1 as key points. However, if you remember, the coefficient of your of the parenthetical expression of your factored function, in this case, that's factored and this is this acts as your coefficient. That negative 2, that factor, it acts as a factor. It is a multiplier of your output. So basically what happens is you plug in a value, you'd add 3 to it. That's going to shift left. You'd square it, and then you'd multiply that by negative 2 before subtracting 4. So that, that, that product, that negative 2, what that does is that affects your output. So we'd multiply that output by negative 2 including the output of our key points. So that's going to shift that. Well, it's going to transform a little bit. It's going to stretch that and reflect it. So we'd get, okay, take the negative 2, multiply your outputs. Not your inputs, just your outputs. And that gives us sort of a, um, a manipulated key point here. So what have we done? We've shifted down four. Yeah, move your horizontal axis. Uh, sorry, horizontal asymptote. We've shifted left three. Yeah, move your vertical asymptote. We had key points, but we know that negative two affects the output. So let's multiply that. We're still going to get symmetry. We still have an even base function. It's not even as far as related to the y-axis anymore, but it is related to your axis of symmetry or your vertical asymptote. They're the same thing when you deal with these, um, these transformed rational functions based on just a, a sort of a power function for rationals. So when we do this, we're going to say, all right, let's use the same scale and plot 1, negative 2 and negative 1, negative 2 from here. So here's 1, negative 2, 1, 2, and negative 1, negative 2, 1, 2. This is going to give us that look. Now, remember, we have to interplay with our asymptotes. So we know that we still have a vertical asymptote. There is no way that we're going to be able to do this up here and still maintain our horizontal asymptote. So we're going to have to come up and go down. So this is decreasing and then increasing as we go from left to right. It still has to be symmetrical about that vertical asymptote. Now this function is a little bit off because I didn't check for the y-intercept. So if we wanted to, we could do stuff like that. So if we wanted to plug in 0, 0 is always going to give us a y-intercept. Is it going to be a y-intercept on this? No, no, no. No, this is the axis of symmetry. This is a vertical asymptote. If you plug in 0, you will get the y-intercept. So let's, let's try that. Plug in 0 and add 3, you're going to get 3. 3 squared is 9. Negative 2 divided by 9 is negative 2 ninths. Minus 4 is negative 4 and 2 ninths. So I have this a little off. It looks like I went right through negative 5. It really should be a bit higher. 
missed it again. And then we could use that symmetry to do the same thing over here. So we'd say this is one, two, three units away from the y-axis, go over one, two, three units away, and you'd have to go through negative four and two ninths as well. Now, let's take a look at the vertical asymptote from the nature of a domain standpoint, make sure it matches, and then we're gonna be good to go. So if we had to do this by just studying the domain, what we would do is we'd, we'd look at our factored function, which we have, and we'd set the factors on the denominator equal to zero by the zero product property, checking for domain issues. And you go, well, there's only one factor. Yeah, it's x plus three. So when we discovered our domain, we said, yeah, you cannot allow x to equal negative three. We have it. There's nothing on x equals negative three. Some students get confused and say, well, I thought you couldn't intersect the y-axis. Well, you can if you start shifting these, these um, rational functions around, you certainly can. It's just that if your domain says x cannot equal zero and you shift it, well, where you shift it to, x cannot equal that value. We shifted left three units. That's why we cannot allow x to equal negative three. How we can't allow it is, look at your factor. If you can't cancel it, it's a vertical asymptote. So at x equals three, we have a vertical asymptote, the multiplicity of which is two. That means it's even. That means it has to go to the same infinity, either both Oops, positive or both negative. That's a must. And so here we're going to both negative and infinity as we approach negative three from the left and right. If you want to go through that, that sort of, um, not really a proof, but an exploration of why it does that, do it. Do it right now. Take something like negative 3.00001. Uh, negative 3.00001 plus three is negative 0.0001. Squared is positive, but very small. Negative two divided by a very, very small positive number is a very, very large negative number. And the same thing would happen if you plugged in negative 2.9999. 2.9999 plus three is uh, 0 0.00001 squared is even smaller. Negative two divided by a very small positive number. Negative divided by a very small positive is gonna give you a very large negative number. That's why they approach the same infinity. If you didn't get, catch that, Think through it a couple more times before you continue. Trust me, it's important for you to understand that idea. All right, let's look at our last example. We got g of x equals negative one over x plus one and then plus two. Some students have a hard time seeing what that is related to. Well, what I'm gonna show you is that when you deal with the reciprocal function and the transformed versions of it, it really helps to show factors on your denominator. So when we factor this, you go, well, one you can't factor, or even negative one if you think about that, you can't factor. And x plus one is already its own factor. Well, wait a minute, if x plus one is already factored enough, let's just call that a factor, and then it's a lot easier to see what's going on. Oh, there's my parentheses. There's my power one. So this is based on the reciprocal function of one over x. It just happens to be shifted. How is it shifted? You should think through that right now. How's that shifted? What's the plus two do? What's the plus one in parentheses do? Well, the plus two shifts up two units. That also shifts our horizontal asymptote. That plus one shifts left one. Well, that also shifts our vertical asymptote. Do we have key points? Yes, of course, but remember, this is now based on an odd function. There is no even power there anymore. This is based on odd function. This is one over x. So the key points for one over x for any odd function are one, one, and negative one, negative one. That's what we would normally graph. However, just like we had in that example, that negative two affected our outputs. This negative one is also going to affect our outputs. You know that that's a reflection. So instead of doing this, this graph is going to do this. It's still going to have opposite infinities. We know 1 over x does, but we're going to have to reflect it. So this negative 1 actually changes our key points a bit. We're going to get 1 comma negative 1 and negative 1 comma positive 1. It's reflected that. And we're going to graph that in relation to our, our sort of new x, y axis, or if you want to think about it this way, 
our asymptotes. These are related to our asymptotes. We know that we're going to get 1, negative 1 in relation to where these asymptotes cross. So based on that scale, here's 1, negative 1. And here's negative 1, positive 1. So 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, and 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1. This gives us that sort of opposite signs for an odd. It's going to yield opposite infinities. We are still going to have symmetry, but it's no longer symmetric about the y-axis. Uh, sorry, the origin, uh, the original origin. It's symmetric about the new origin. Now, this is not really the origin of the graph, but this is where we shifted to. So we do have symmetry, but it's about that point, no longer that point because we shifted. Now, let's think about what this would have to do. In order to our, obey our asymptotes and still hit these key points, we have to look like this. And we are sketching. If we want to be a little bit better about it, we plug in some values like um, negative one half. We do something like that. We plug in maybe negative one and a half. You want to plug in something like negative two. Well, it's not negative two. We already have that point. But something like uh, one or negative three. You could do that. You can still use symmetry here as well. So if you wanted to, you could plug in something like one. And so let's see. Let's, let's do that. So if I plug in one. I would get 1 plus 1 is 2, uh, negative 1 over 2 is negative 1 half, plus 2 is positive 1 and a half. So I know that this has a point at 1, comma, here's 1 and a half, right about there. Well, what that means is that if I, uh, if I take this symmetry, please watch carefully, where's the symmetry happen? Across the y? or across the axis of symmetry. And it's gotta be the axis of symmetry, that vertical asymptote. This is one, two units away from the axis of symmetry. If I go two units away on the other side, one, two, and then I take this as, all right, this was half a unit below the horizontal asymptote. At this value, I need to be half a unit above the vertical asymptote. That's a foul right, right there. Then we can use the symmetry. Remember how, uh, how odds work. You do opposite values equals opposite values. So if I was two units away from the axis of symmetry and I have an odd function, one's below and one's above. The same exact sort of spacing, if you will, on that horizontal asymptote. So we can do that, use, uh, use symmetry as well, and get a fairly good looking graph for at least minimal work. Now let's take a look at the domain, make sure that actually works. Domain would say from a factor function, uh, in this case a rational, we're going to take every single factor on the denominator that has a variable and set it equal to zero. That's going to define what we can't have in our domain. You can't allow negative one. We haven't. Uh, well, how can't you have it? Can you cancel the factor? No. If you can't, then you have a vertical asymptote. And in this case, the multiplicity is odd. Odd means opposite infinities in one of those ways, depending on the sign of the function, which we talked about. So this is model perfect. This says, hey, at x equals negative 1, we can't allow it. How can't you allow it? It's sort of like a force field. It's a vertical asymptote. You can't touch that. Um, how it's going to interact is it's going to give you opposite infinities. Now, focus on the why. Why is it doing this? If we start plugging in some values that are getting really close to negative 1, this is called a limit. So as we're approaching from the left and from the right, what is happening? From the right-hand side, as we get to closer to negative 1 from the right-hand side, this is like negative 0.9999999. Focus on this. If I plug in negative 0.9999999, negative 0.9999999 plus 1 is positive, positive 0.00000001. To the first power, that's still positive 0 0.0000001. But a negative constant, any constant really, divided by a super small number is going to be an epically large negative number. And that's an oxymoron. But an absolute value is really big, it's just negative. So a negative divided by a really small positive 
is very, very negative. That's negative infinity. Even when you add two, it's still gonna be approaching negative infinity. That's why this graph has to do this. Now, focus on the other side. Stick with me. If I go from the left, this is from the left-hand side. If I plug in something getting really close to negative one, like uh, negative 1.0000000 for a whole long time and a little one, and I add one, what's gonna happen? Negative 1.0001, plus one is still negative 0.00001. Now I take the first power, oh my gosh, it's still negative. But wait, negative to one divided by a negative really small number. Negative divided by negative is a positive, but it's gonna be huge, a huge positive number. So as I'm coming this way, I'm starting to get really, 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 really big numbers, and I add two, it's even bigger. That's gonna to explode to positive infinity. This is why these have opposite infinities. Odds always do this because they have opposite signs for values that are on opposite sides of a vertical asymptote. That's why. Evens are different than that. Evens have the same sign for opposite sides of a vertical asymptote. I hope that makes sense. Um, I hope now you have a, a very good connection between the transformations and these rational functions and seeing what a vertical asymptote will do. It's a hugely important thing because we're gonna be graphing these. We're not gonna do specifically with key points, uh, but we're gonna be using the, the fact that odds do this or this and evens do this or this. And now hopefully you have a better understanding of why. So next time we'll talk about horizontal asymptotes. We'll talk about oblique asymptotes and then we'll start getting into graphing rationals. Hope you're doing well.